Dr. Baker, how extensive was your survey? It was very extensive, Jim. We uh, started out wanting to... Uh, that's right. Don't say Jim, because we're going to send this to major TV stations. Okay. And they want them to think okay. that it's their own reporter. Okay, okay. sorry about that. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> With my show, that would be fine. <laughs> okay, good. <clears throat> Dr. Baker, how extensive was the survey? It was very extensive. We wanted to find out what the attitudes and experiences of all Indiana women office holders were. So we sent surveys, questionnaires out to every woman office holder, got a response rate of 60%, and then we've been using this data for quite a while. Then we wanted to do some comparisons, both on the basis of female versus male responses, also responses across different political cultures. So we added Indiana male office holders to our sample, and then we expanded and we went to Tennessee and we went to Wisconsin and surveyed men and women office holders in both of those states. So we have a, a very good uh, collection of data. Does Indiana have more or less women office holders than Tennessee and Wisconsin? They have more. They have more, and one of the reasons is that we have a different type of political culture. Daniel Elazar, a rather famous political scientist in the area of state politics, talks about three different types of political cultures. The individualistic, where running for office is really a, a major way to, for an individual or a group to attain some uh, status. That's Indiana, where a job-oriented, individual-oriented political culture. Wisconsin is what he calls moralistic, more interested in the policies and the issues, and people there have a different party structure. The party's not so important. What's really more important are the issues, and so people are kind of amateurs getting in and out of politics based on what issues are, are current. And then Tennessee is an example of the traditionalistic culture where there's a pretty much of an elite are in control, and we find women getting less into office in Tennessee than either of the other two states, but Indiana's way ahead. Dr. Meyer, what did you find in your report in respect to the influence of women on politics? Well, one question that uh, exists in the political science literature is whether or not it will make a difference uh, if women are elected to office. And our findings suggest that it will make a difference as more and more women come into office. In Indiana, the majority of women identify themselves as conservatives. However, that normally only relates to their support for the private sector as a way to deal with economic problems. But when you start looking into social problems, when you start looking into uh, issues of gender policy, questions of discrimination against women. Uh, women politicians are much more sensitive to those issues and are much more likely to respond in a positive way to dealing with those particular problems. Did you find discrimination against women candidates? Uh, we didn't uh, have a specific question, but we did find that the women were much more sensitive to discrimination than males and were much more concerned about that as a policy problem. Is there a discrimination in respect to any office that a woman would not be elected to in Indiana? Well, women certainly do not show up in proportion to their part of the population uh, in Indiana politics. Uh, the percentage of women in the state legislature is someplace around 14 percent. Uh, we have a much smaller proportion in the United States Congress. If you look at the Congress as a whole, 4 percent of the people in Congress are women. So obviously something is going on that they aren't getting into office. Now, the political science literature suggests that the biggest problem for women is to overcome the uh, difficulty of incumbency. If they can once become an incumbent, then they don't have as much problem. Uh, but if they do, in fact, uh, try to run and they're running against the incumbent, they normally have a great deal of difficulty. Now, of course, there's something going on right now in Indiana that's uh, complete opposite to what I just said, and that is the non-slating of Virginia Blankenbaker, who is the incumbent, uh, but was not slated even though she has uh, been in office for two terms. Uh, and that is a very significant issue among uh, women politicians in Indiana, whether they be Democrats or Republicans, because she is seen as somebody who has been very supportive of women's issues uh, in the Indiana. Indiana legislature. There is a theory, Fred, is, is there not, that, that some political scientists argue that women hold the jobs in state and local politics that men don't want. And if, if that theory is at all valid, what we have seen in Indiana is there are not very many women coroners, there's not very many women elected sheriff, there are not many women elected prosecutor, and there are not many women elected mayor. So those are positions which are still pretty much a male club. 
We see, as Fred mentioned, more women in the state legislators, le state legislatures, city councils, uh, where women show up in great numbers, county treasurers, city clerk treasurers, uh, auditors, and, and offices of that nature. So as we look at raw numbers, we have to do more than that. We have to look at where women are showing up and what kinds of offices, and, and are we or are we not getting away from that pattern of, of women only getting the offices that the male political chieftains say are, are okay for them to hold? They, indica they indicated that they were less likely to get uh, support from party leaders when they were running for the more uh, prestigious offices, such as state legislative office. Uh, they did not get as much party support there. Would you say this is a form of discrimination? It's, it's a form of, of maybe institutional discrimination as opposed to maybe a, a party leader sitting around thinking, I certainly don't want a woman there. But I think institutions grow and cultures take on a life of their own. And, and I think if you would ask the, the voter on the street, you know, picture a prosecutor, draws a picture, and what would you think? They'd probably start talking about male attributes and the same for a sheriff. And I think that's, in, in that sense, yes. Also, I think that the pool of potential candidates has been increasing in recent years, and some of the party people have not uh, figured that out yet. But there's more and more women who are going to graduate school, professional school, and law school who will be potential candidates for office. Texas has elected a governor, woman governor. Do you see any time in the near future where Indiana might do this? Kentucky, of course, is, is a more traditionalistic state than Indiana, and they had a female governor as well. It's always possible. I, it, it, I think when you're dealing with such a small sample of number of women elected governor, it would take a kind of an unusual set of events. Uh, sure, it's possible, but I'm not even sure that one governor here or there uh, in a very figurehead kind of position is really going to break down the barriers. It would serve as a good role example, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Are women concerned about the barriers? I think they are. I think that one of the, the ways we're going with our research, I think that may be really the key, is what women that are in office themselves serve as recruiters. We ask two different types of questions. Do you talk to individual women and try to encourage them to run for politics? And then do you talk to groups of women and try to encourage them? And we have found some interesting things like... Uh, uh, age isn't particularly important, or party. We have women of all ages that turn around and serve as recruiters and of both political parties. But there are some other factors that, that tend to be important. And one of them is that women who serve as recruiters tend to have gotten their start in terms of support or encouragement from other women's groups. And so what I think we're going to see, if women are going to succeed on the state and local level, or continue to succeed, this kind of networking that we hear about old boy networks, uh, this has to take place, and it, I think it's beginning to take place. And we're seeing about 30 to 35 percent of the women on our sample are serving as recruiters. And, and I think it's interesting that Indiana women are more likely, once they're in office, to turn around and be a recruiter of, of other women. And I think that's important. And these are the more educated women uh, in our sample. So they see that as an important component of their work in, in Indiana politics. Uh, and it's very interesting because males tend to be uh, more individualistic. They're not out there doing that kind of help uh, for other males. You don't see that going on. Whereas uh, females realize that they're dealing with a climate that historically has not included them, and so they're working to open up that, that climate. Have we seen a major change in the last few years in attitude and uh, role acceptance uh, in respect to running for office? Well, I can't uh, cite attitudes of the citizenry from an Indiana study, but there is a study that was done in Cincinnati uh, that was just published about three months ago, which indicates that there are not major differences between males and females in the population in general in their attitudes toward uh, female, po female candidates, uh, so that there appears to be a reservoir of goodwill. That's why uh, people are stressing the importance of getting women incumbents, getting them into office for the first time. And once they get into those significant offices, uh, then they can help more and more people get into office. What our study does address, though, is the women themselves. We asked them what were their experiences, what problems have they had. And what they indicate is they're still expected to do everything. If they're the office holder, they're still expected to go home at night, take care of most of the household duties. And that role conflict, the guild if the children aren't taken care of, that, that doesn't seem to, to spread to the male office holder. And so that's where the difficulties come in. As Fred said, I think among the electorate, 
we'll see more and more acceptance. But I, I think we're putting on women who are politically ambitious a terrible role conflict, all kinds of guilt complexes. We hear more and more about latchkey children and how children are more undisciplined and not as good as students today. If you read between the lines in those studies, we tend to be blaming the women of this country. And so we're asking them to do everything. And I think that's where the difficulty comes in from the actual politician side, not so much the voter side.